in the 12th lecture of this course, we are beginning a new topic that is carrier transport. So far, we have seen how the carrier concentration is decided in a semiconductor. Now, in this lecture, we would like to see how the carriers can be transported, what are the various ways in which the carriers can move. Some of the topics which will be covered uh, in this lecture are examples of various modes of transport, the random thermal motion of carriers, then scattering mechanisms, drift and diffusion, relation between mobility and diffusivity, mobility versus doping and temperature, resistivity versus temperature and drift from the energy band point of view. So, let us begin with the examples of various modes of transport. Now, this is an example of the drift transport. Here to a semiconductor sample, a voltage has been applied which results in a current. The flow of current in the semiconductor here in this case is due to drift. This is another example of transport. Here the sample is being illuminated at one end. The assumption about the light that is falling on the sample is that the quantum of energy or the quantum of the photon here, the energy of that is greater than the energy gap. So, that the photon can help in creation of electron hole pair by breaking off silicon silicon bond. So, since the light is going to be absorbed within a short distance from the surface about a micron or so, the excess carriers or extra carriers will be created only near the surface. Therefore, the concentration of carriers near the surface will be higher than in the bulk and concentration gradient of carriers is therefore established. This is shown here with the help of a graph the whole concentration is more at the surface and it, it is decreasing to the equilibrium value in the bulk. Similarly, you can have variation for the electron concentration because, because electrons and holes are generated in pairs. Now, because of this gradient of the concentration, let us say for the holes, you will have a tendency for the holes to move from left to right and there will be a hole current. This hole current is due to diffusion. Similarly, you can also have an electron current due to diffusion in this case because electrons are more here than inside. Let us look at another example of carrier transport. Here you can see that there is a sample to which two contacts have been made. One contact has been kept at a higher temperature than the other contact. This can be easily achieved for example, by placing a soldering iron near this contact. So, this contact becomes uh, hotter than this contact. In fact, the soldering iron itself can be used as the tip of the soldering iron can be used as a contact here. And if you connect an ammeter between the two, you will find that there is a current flow through the ammeter. The ammeter will show a deflection. If the sample is P type, then you will find that the current is moving from cold to hot junction. In the n-type sample, the polarity of the current will be the opposite. That is, the direction of flow of the current will be opposite. So, here there is a current because of temperature gradient. Temperature here is different from temperature here and therefore, there is a current established. So, this kind of current is called thermoelectric current. Finally, this is another example of carrier transport. Here, this is an insulator. and you have two metal contacts on either end. So, this is just like a parallel plate capacitor. Now, if we are assuming that this is a perfect insulator. So, strictly speaking, when you apply a voltage between these two metal contacts, there should be no current. However, if the insulator is very thin, meaning of the order of say tens of angstroms. Okay? 
few tens of angstroms insulator thickness then you find a current in response to a voltage this current flowing through the insulator is because of tunneling now these uh, three mechanisms of transport namely drift diffusion and thermoelectric current these three are referred to as semi classical mechanisms this is because although the basic picture is quantum mechanical in nature of this transport we can use some simplifications after which the transport can be treated using the classical principles of physics without invoking need to invoke quantum mechanics on the other hand this particular mechanism that is tunneling is a quantum mechanical phenomenon okay that is because you cannot explain it without the help of quantum mechanics no simplification is possible so that you can use classical mechanics or classical physics to explain this particular phenomenon in this course we will be concentrating on drift and diffusion these two mechanisms of semi classical transport okay now let us see what are the things we are going to discuss about these mechanisms so first this is a slide showing the drift transport where if you vary the field in the semiconductor how the drift velocity changes the velocity of the electrons and holes resulting from drift change changes it is important to note the uh, magnitudes in of the quantities involved so you see that beyond about 20 kilovolt per centimeter the velocity of electrons is almost saturating even though you increase electric field there is no change in the velocity and this saturation velocity is about 10 power 7 centimeters per second for the holes the saturation occurs much later okay maybe around 100 kilo volt per centimeter this is the picture in silicon at 300 k for small electric fields however the velocity of electrons and holes increases linearly with electric field so for small electric field means for example here for electrons below about uh, 10 kilo volt per centimeter you have a kind of linear segment of this particular curve okay so this is these are uh, two things that we will have to explain that is for small electric field the drift velocity is linearly related to the field whereas for high electric fields the velocity saturates so how does this happen now it is uh, necessary to note that uh, 10 kilo volt per centimeter is uh, about uh, is equal to 1 volt per micron so this gives you a feel for the quantity 10 kilo volt per centimeter of electric field means 10 into 10 power 3 volts by 10 power 4 microns which is 1 volt per micron okay so those are the kind of uh, fields that are involved in this next let us look at velocity field relation in a compound semiconductor such as gallium arsenide here the behavior is shown for electrons you find here that for high electric fields there is a saturation and for low electric fields there is a linear behavior but in between these two linear and saturation regions there is a region where the velocity peaks and then falls off okay so therefore there is a region here where the velocity decreases with the electric field this is unique feature of the drift transport in compound semiconductors in general the order of magnitude of the quantities involved here the saturation velocity is of the order of 10 power 7 per centimeter centimeters per second which is of the same order as in silicon for electrons however you can see here that the fields at which the saturation occurs okay 
is somewhat lower than the field that we encountered in silicon okay so here by 10 kilo volt per centimeter saturation is taking place and what is more important here is that the linear range is occurring at much lower electric fields okay is restricted to much lower electric fields and therefore the slope of uh, this particular linear portion which is the mobility that is the ratio of the drift velocity to field in the linear region this is called the mobility so this ratio or this slope or the mobility is much higher in the case of gallium arsenide than in the case of silicon okay so whereas the linear range was about 10 kilovolt per centimeter in the case of silicon here it is about 2 kilovolt per centimeter so you see five times difference between the mobility of silicon and gallium arsenide of electrons mobility of electrons in gallium arsenide is five times that in silicon so now let us discuss the behavior of the mobility that is the ratio of the velocity to the electric field in the linear region so this particular uh, parameter it varies with the total impurity concentration within the semiconductor so this is something that we will like to explain it decreases as your total impurity concentration increases also note that the mobility of electrons is higher than the mobility of holes okay much higher now another point to note is that what is being plotted here is total impurity concentration the concentration of uh, electrons for example in an n type semiconductor would depend on the difference between the n type doping and the p type doping or it is dependent on the net doping okay so carrier concentrations depend on the net doping whereas the mobility depends on the total doping that is the sum of the doping concentrations this is what is important to see here next variation of mobility of silicon with temperature for different doping levels as can, you can see from here that the mobility increases for low temperatures as the temperature is increased it reaches a peak and then it falls off as the temperature increases okay so this is a behavior that we would like to explain for higher and higher dopings the mobility is lower that is the peak goes on decreasing so this is the peak for 4 into 10 power 13 per centimeter cube doping this is the peak for a sample in which you have both n type and p type doping so this peak will depend on some of these two quantities and this peak here is for even higher doping levels okay that is what is shown here so this is another thing that we would like to explain then we come to the diffusivity or the constant associated with the diffusion mode of transport in analogy to the mobility which is the constant associated with drift transport it turns out that the diffusivity can be calculated from the mobility using this relation diffusivity is equal to mobility into thermal voltage okay at any temperature d is equal to mu into thermal voltage this relation is called the einstein relation so we will show how this relation is derived finally we will see the resistivity of the semiconductors so here we have shown resistivity varying with doping concentration okay the concentration here is doping concentration for p type and n type so the, this behavior is what we will see by combining the mobility and the doping effect of doping or carrier concentration behavior another important aspect of the resistivity is the variation of resistivity with temperature so here the reciprocal of resistivity that is conductivity has been plotted with temperature you have the three regions here corresponding to the extrinsic range which is 2 this is the range in which the dopants are ionized partially and this is the intrinsic range so you see in the extrinsic range the conductivity increases and then decreases okay so this is something that we will show so conductivity or the resistivity so now let us begin with the 
uh, explanations for these mechanisms of transport. As we will see, these mechanisms of transport are dependent on the random thermal motion of carriers at any temperature. So, the first topic that we will discuss is the random thermal motion of carriers. Now, we will start with the picture under equilibrium. This is a slide that we showed under equilibrium conditions. This slide shows generation and recombination of carriers. So, under equilibrium, generation is exactly balanced by recombination. A carrier is generated, it stays alive for some time and then it recombines. Now, between the point or the instant the carrier is generated and the instant the carrier recombines, it moves around. Now, this movement also if you include, then the picture is something like this. This is the random motion of carriers. So, this motion can be the path of a carrier between generation and recombination is something like this. Okay. So, let us say here the carrier is generated. So, point 1 is generation. And this is point 2 is recombination. So, between generation and recombination, the carrier is moving about in the crystal. Now, notice the path of the carrier because the temperature is greater than 0. The carrier has a thermal velocity and that is why after it is uh, created or generated, it starts moving. But then when it moves, it finds other particles also which are present and as a result, it is getting scattered by the other particles. It collides with the other particles and its direction of motion is changed. So, each of these points here where you see a change in the direction of motion is a point that shows scattering. So, this is the result of collision of the particle with other particles which are present. What are the other particles which are present? The, in the previous uh, discussion, we have listed these particles as phonons or vibrating silicon atoms, then electrons, then holes and now if you have a doped semiconductor, you must also include the impurities. In particular, we must note that the impurities are ionized at any temperature greater than 0, although not fully, at least partially. In the extrinsic range, the ionization is complete. So, we can say ionized impurities. Okay. Although some scattering does take place from neutral impurities, we will not bother about it. Now, notice that we have not listed photons here, okay, because the photons have a small momentum okay, and therefore, the effect of collision of a carrier with a photon, the effect of this collision on the carrier is not significant. So, we will not bother about it. So, we are left with these particles, phonons, electrons and holes and ionized impurities. So, for example, an electron which is moving can collide with phonon, can collide with electrons or holes or can collide with ionized impurities. So, this form of scattering of electrons with phonons is called lattice scattering or phonon scattering. It is called lattice scattering because phonons are nothing but vibrating silicon atoms or lattice sites. So, that is why it is called lattice scattering. The scattering with electrons and holes, okay, this is called carrier carrier scattering.
and the scattering with ionized impurities is called ionized impurity scattering. Now here it is important to note how the scattering of an electron in carrier carrier scattering and energy impurity scattering is different from that in lattice scattering. You see scattering with the phonon is a physical collision between the carrier and the atomic site whereas in the case of the other two mechanisms of transport here this particular scattering is because of action at a distance it need not involve a physical collision because this is collision between charged particles okay. For example, supposing an electron is moving like this and it sees an acceptor type impurity ionized acceptor type impurity then it is going to be repelled as it comes near the impurity and therefore its direction will change something like this. So this is the scattering that is taking place it is action at a distance not necessarily a physical collision. Similar comments apply to electron colliding with another electron or electron colliding with hole. Now it is important to note that an electron colliding with a hole when the collision is action at a distance it is scattering okay it results in scattering whereas if an electron meets a hole physically then a recombination can take place. It is very clear that the chances of recombination are less than chances of scattering between electron and hole because for recombination you require that they physically meet each other okay. So one must not think that electron and hole whenever there is a collision it is always resulting in a recombination not necessary it can be resulting in scattering. So these are the mechanisms by which the carrier is getting scattered and that is why it results in a path something like this and that is why you have a random motion of carriers. Now please understand the difference between scattering and reflection. In reflection the direction of motion of the particle which is getting reflected okay can be predicted but in scattering the direction of motion of the particle which has result which has encountered a collision cannot be predicted okay exactly and that is why there is some randomness involved. So that is the difference between scattering and reflection. Coming back to this picture of the random thermal motion the distance between any two successive collisions that a tra that a carrier travels okay. So this distance or say this distance this is called the mean free path. So this is called the free path and if you average the free paths for all these different periods of travel you get what is called the mean free path. Normally we use a symbol L suffix C to indicate the mean free path C stands for collision. So mean free path between two collisions okay so it is average of all the free paths that the carrier uh, undergoes between collisions because the paths between collisions will not be the same they are all distributed because it is random picture. So average of that is the mean free path. Now the time between any two collisions that is time of the free path is called free time. And like mean free path if you average the free times you get mean free time that has a symbol tau c. So tau c or mean free time is another parameter and finally you have the parameter namely the random velocity thermal velocity. which is also a mean okay except that we will see this is root mean square average okay. So this point we will see later this is the thermal velocity. So one can uh, roughly use the relation V thermal is equal to LC by tau C okay. So average thermal velocity is the mean free path by mean free time. Now let us look at the um, some of the properties of this 
random thermal motion. Specifically we will see that this picture implies intense motion but no net motion. What is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is the velocity of the carrier okay, which is undergoing this motion is very high. It is of the order of 10 power 7 centimeters per second at room temperature. So there is intense activity, but on the average okay, the motion does not amount to anything. That is the meaning of no net motion. That is there is no motion in any single direction. Okay. The effects of these various uh, small motions during the mean free paths okay, is getting cancelled. So let us look at this aspect in greater detail. So properties of random motion. First is no net motion. So the word net is important. So what does this mean? There are several ways of interpreting this particular statement. Okay. So one way of interpreting this is in terms of average of the velocity. So average velocity is 0. So average of the velocity of the carrier x, y or z components that average the bar here indicates the average is 0. Now the question is how do you determine this average? So there are two ways of determining the average. One is called the ensemble average. This means that supposing I look at the picture of the semiconductor, take a sufficiently large population of carriers at any instant of time, if I freeze the picture and note the velocities, like this for the population. And then if I take the average of all these velocities at any instant, I sum up all these velocities and divide by the number. So I will get this average as 0. In other words, sum of the velocities will be 0. So this is one interpretation of no net motion. Okay. Another interpretation of no net motion is the time average. Here you follow the path of a particle over a sufficiently long period of time. Okay. So you are looking at a single particle over a sufficiently long period of time. Here in the ensemble average you are looking at a sufficiently large population of particles, sufficiently large number of particles at any instant of time. Here in the time average you look at a sufficiently long duration of time but you monitor a single particle and then you will have this path that we have shown. Now what the time average gives you, if you average the this particular the velocity over a long period of time. Okay? So here the velocity is in this direction, here it is in this direction and here it is in this direction and so on. So you find out the time average which amounts to taking the net displacement of this particular carrier over a long period of time, then that displacement would be net displacement is 0. Okay? So time average of the velocity, you average all these velocities for the single particle during at different instants and then you will get that average as 0. Okay? So that is another in interpretation of the no net motion. So a carrier is not really getting displaced, right? even though it is moving about ultimately it returns to the point. Another way of interpreting no net motion is if you take a plane and see the average flux across this plane, which means what you observe for a certain duration of time, find out how many 
carriers are crossing say right to left and you also observe how many cross left to right. Then you will find the number of carriers crossing from left to right is the same as number of carriers crossing from right to left in that duration. This is the meaning of the average flux is 0 in any time duration across any plane. So, this is another interpretation of no net motion. Now, what is the meaning of intense motion? If I were to take the speeds of the particles that I have noted here, I ignore the velocity, uh, I ignore the direction. Instead of the velocity, I take the speed, I ignore the direction and take only the magnitude of the velocity and then all these speeds I take and then I find out their root mean square average. Okay? So, root mean square that is you square the speeds, then you take their mean and then you take the square root. Okay? So, that velocity, so root mean square velocity RMS speed, this RMS speed is very very high and that is the so called V thermal. So, though the average of the velocities is 0, okay, the root mean square speed is very very high. This is the meaning of intense motion. Now, we must also remember some figures. Okay. So, what is the meaning of this intense motion? So, thermal velocity as we said is of the order of 10 power 7 per centimeters, uh, centimeters per second. The mean free time between collisions this is of the order of 10 power minus 5 centimeters. And the mean free time between collisions as you can see if this is 10 power 7, this 10 power minus 5, this is of the order of 10 power minus 12 seconds or picoseconds. So, L c 10 power minus 5 centimeters is means it is 0 0.1 microns, tau c is about 10 power minus 12 seconds that is 1 picosecond okay? and thermal velocity is 10 power 7 centimeters per second. So, tau c of 10 power minus 12 seconds or picosecond means that within 1 second we have 10 power 12 collisions right this really large number of collisions. So, these are the parameters that we must remember this is for 300 k the values are given for 300 k okay? and generally these values hold for a different semiconductors although from semiconductor to semiconductor this uh, these parameters will definitely change somewhat. Now, we will have to see on the basis of this random thermal motion, how can you explain the various mechanisms of transport. Okay? So, that is what we will do next. One can start from any one of these pictures under equilibrium for this purpose. Okay? It turns out that uh, it is very easy to explain the various mechanisms of transport using for example, this particular picture as a starting point. Okay? So, see, see that transport results whenever you disturb the equilibrium by external excitation. Okay? The excitation may cause a potential gradient or a concentration gradient or it could cause a temperature gradient. Right? That is how you get drift, diffusion and thermoelectric currents. So, we want to explain if this is the picture under equilibrium that is the average flux is equal to 0 across any plane then how is it that the average flux will be non-zero whenever you apply the excitations that I have just mentioned. Okay? So, let us draw the same picture on a magnified scale. So, let us say this is the plane 
of our observation. Okay? And now we want to know under equilibrium what is the flux of carriers from left to right and what is the flux of carriers from right to left. And then when you apply the excitation, how these two fluxes are disturbed. So, flux of carriers from left to right if we want to know. Let us assume a one dimensional situation. And now, this particular region that we have shown here is the region in which this distance is equal to the mean free path. So, this is L c. It will soon become clear why we are considering a region which is whose uh, width is equal to L c. To find out the flux, okay, we need to observe the carriers which are crossing this particular plane in any one direction in a certain time duration. Okay. Now, if it is a one dimensional situation, it is clear that a carrier which is on this side here next to this plane of observation. So, this is the plane of observation. Carrier which is here, if it is crossing this plane to the right, okay, it will cross this plane with a thermal velocity V thermal. Now, a carrier which is at a distance L c here, if it is moving to the right, then it will just end up crossing the plane by the time it reaches here, okay, because it encounters a collision after a distance L c. Now, all other carriers in between these two points which are moving to the right will always cross the plane. A carrier which is out of this region, say somewhere here, if it is moving to the right, it will travel a distance L c and then it will encounter a collision and we do not know after collision whether it will go this side or that side. Okay? So, we can therefore say that carriers which are within this region and which are moving to the right will cross this plane. Let us talk about holes. We have to talk about holes and electrons separately. So, we consider holes. Okay? We can whatever we do for holes can be applied to electrons also. So, the holes, let us say the concentration of holes in this semiconductor is P and it is uniform. So, the holes which are in this width and which are moving to the right will cross this plane. What is the number of these holes? The number of these holes can be written as P, the concentration into the volume of that region that is L c into the area of this particular cross section. Okay? Let us assume a unit area of cross section for simplicity. So, P into L c into 1 okay? that is P into L c. So, so many carriers are there in this region. Now, exactly half the half of these carriers will move from left to right and half of these carriers will move in this direction. Okay? That is because that is the only way you can have no net motion across any plane. If I want no net motion across this plane, for example, if all the carriers in this region are only travelling to the right, then none of these are travelling to the left. So, same thing will be applicable for carriers on this side. So, they will only be travelling to the right. I will end up getting a net flux across this particular plane. So, since I do not want a flux across any plane, when I say do not want, I mean there is no flux. That is the equilibrium condition. So, it implies, it is very clear that exactly half of the carriers should move to the right and other half should move to the left. And therefore, half of this number of carriers denotes the flux from left to right. Okay? Now, what is the duration of observation? No, this is not exactly the flux. This is the number of carriers moving left to right. Now, what is the duration in which these carriers move? 
clearly the duration is tau c because we are making an observation during one mean free collision time. It is during this time that this all these carriers will move from left to right. So, in tau c if you divide this is the number of carriers crossing and tau c is the time over which this crossing occurs. So, this is your flux. from left to right. Similarly, one can show that flux from right to left is also same in magnitude. Okay? So, this is the magnitude of this flux and this is also equal to the flux from left to right. So, this is under equilibrium. Okay? So, under equilibrium this is the flux. We can simplify this relation and we can write this as P into the velocity of L c by tau c is nothing but the random velocity. So, P v upon 2. Under equilibrium, this v is v thermal. It is a thermal velocity under equilibrium. Now, you starting from this particular relation of these fluxes, one can show how a net flux can result across any plane. Now, the net flux, so flux across the plane is f in this direction minus f in the other direction, these magnitudes. That is the net flux across the plane. Now, this quantity will be 0 for equilibrium, that is what we have seen. Now, how do you explain that starting from this point, there can be a net flux? Now, clearly, if this quantity P v by 2 is different for this region than for this region, let us call this region 1 and this is region 2 then the net flux will not be 0. What does this mean? This means that if P in 1, the concentration of holes in region 1 is different from concentration of region um, holes in region 2, then the net flux will be given by P 1 minus P 2 into V by 2 is the net flux in that direction. So, F net is equal to this. Okay? If it is a non-equilibrium situation where P 1 is different from P 2. So, evidently this is not equal to 0. Okay? If P 1 is for P 1 not equal to P 2. So, this is how a concentration difference in the two regions results in a net flux. So, this is the diffusion transport. This is explanation of the diffusion transport, net flux across any plane because of concentration gradient. Now, we can similarly explain how you can get drift. For example, if there is an electric field in this direction. Then this electric field will aid the movement of holes from left to right, but it will oppose the movement of holes from right to left. Okay? So, all the holes which are crossing in this direction, their velocities will be reduced. So, if you call that velocity as V2 and you call the velocity of carriers which are moving from region 1 to region 2 as V1, then you get a difference for the two fluxes. Okay? So, F net is equal to P into V 1 minus V 2 upon 2 
which is not equal to 0 for v1 not equal to v2. Okay. So here we have uh, just now we saw how because of electric field v1 which is this velocity in this direction for carriers is higher than the velocity of carriers in this direction. So if v, v1 not equal to v2 due to field this implies that this particular transport there is a transport and this is called the drift transport. On the other hand V1 can be different from V2 also because of temperature gradient. See if in region 1 the temperature is more than that in region 2 okay, then we know that the random velocity of carriers is a function of temperature it increases as the temperature increases. So the random velocity in region 1 will be more than the random velocity in region 2 okay. if there is a temperature difference T1 and T2 T1 is more than T2. So you can have V1 not equal to V2 also due to temperature gradient. So or temperature difference that is T1 not equal to T2 then this current is thermoelectric current. Okay. So that is how one can explain both drift and thermoelectric currents using this particular equation. So we summarize our discussion so far in terms of this important statement all mechanisms of semi classical transport namely drift diffusion and thermoelectric current result from the superimposition of a directed motion over the random motion. So it is the superimposition of a directed motion over the random motion. Random motion is the basis and there is an intense random motion under equilibrium and when you apply the external excitations such as concentration gradient, potential gradient or temperature gradients then a directed motion is superimposed over the random motion. There are interesting analogies to explain this particular concept of motion of carriers in semiconductors. So one such analogy is this. Supposing uh, in fact this uh, analogy is description of a situation that we often see in uh, many of the shops, sweet meat shops okay, which sell sweets uh, kept in the open. So this is one such box of sweet which is exposed okay, which is kept open it is not a good habit but then it turns out that this particular situation is quite useful to explain the mechanisms of transport, semi classical transport. So you have over this uh, particular uh, open box of sweet many flies okay, hovering around undergoing random motion. So you have a population of flies. So flies in random motion. flies or insects we can say in general insects now this is the movement of the uh, insects over this particular box of sweet represent the situation of carriers under equilibrium now if you start moving this box of sweet slowly let us say to the left what will happen these insects will also try to remain above the box of the sweet and therefore they will also gradually move 
Now this is an example of drift transport. Okay, how uh, directed motion is being superimposed on the random motion. Now the word drift indicates a slow movement. So what is happening is that when your excitation is small, the directed motion is uh, very small compared to the intense random motion. Okay, so that is why it is said to slowly drift. The carriers are said to slowly drift. Now if you want to give the example for a diffusion that is something like this. Supposing you open up another box of sweet here, okay, where there are no flies now at this instant. So suddenly what would happen is some of the flies will try to get over to this side okay, and that is the example of diffusion transport. So they will be randomly moving among themselves and then as they are moving some of them will try to move over to this side okay to remain on this so that is the example of diffusion transport this is how one can explain the drift and diffusion phenomena now before closing the discussion i would like to emphasize the point that this phenomenon of transport such as by drift diffusion or thermoelectric current has a quantum mechanical basis that we cannot forget that is why these are not called purely classical phenomena but semi classical phenomena so now what is the quantum mechanical basis that we must take into account before applying classical principles to understand this transport now you look at the random thermal motion of carriers this is happening because of scattering this scattering should strictly be regarded as a wave phenomenon for a complete and correct understanding of the transport let me explain this with the example take up ionized impurity scattering supposing we have a medium in which you have re regularly arranged ionized impurities in this case let us say these are ionized donors if an electron is entering this medium then if we use classical principles then it would get scattered as shown by this particular line here okay in other words the direction of motion is going to change because of attractive forces here then again it is going to change because of attractive forces here however quantum mechanics says that an electron wave entering a periodically varying potential medium cannot be scattered in other words according to the quantum mechanical picture no scattering of this electron wave will take place okay scattering will occur only if the impurity atoms are randomly located as shown here so quantum mechanics says that if an electron wave enters a randomly varying potential medium okay a medium in which the potential is varying randomly then the electron wave will be scattered now it turns out that in a semiconductor the impurity atoms are randomly located so when you apply quantum mechanical principles you find the conclusion that the electron wave will be scattered now once you know the electron wave will be scattered how it will be scattered and so on can be derived from a simple classical picture wherein you assume that this electron is a particle and it is interacting with other impurity atoms now this idea of the scattering as a wave phenomenon okay has been explained with the help of an analogy in this publication so this publication titled appealing analogies for aiding students assimilation of some key physical concepts related to semiconductor devices was published in IEEE transactions on education in volume 42 November 1999 on page number 328 I will briefly describe this analogy here consider the scattering of an electromagnetic wave in a glass slab okay let us assume that there is a glass slab and you have a viewer who is looking at the glass slab only from the side okay so the glass slab is something like this light is falling from this side on this slab and you are viewing only at the edge there is an incident light so you will have some reflected light and some light will be transmitted now if the glass slab was perfect that is the refractive index of the medium of this glass slab was exactly uniform then from the side you will not find the glass slab glowing that is you will not be able to detect the presence of the light on the left hand side however in practice our experience is different 
when we see the slab from the side we see it glowing which means some light is coming out in this direction which is perpendicular to the direction in which the light is incident this is because the light is getting scattered okay so what is coming out of the edge is the scattered light the scattering takes place because in practice the glass slab has randomly varying refractive index the refractive index of the glass slab is not uniform it is not constant it is varying randomly so a medium in which the refractive index is varying randomly scattered an electromagnetic wave which is incident on the medium and which is getting transmitted through the medium so exactly in a similar way if you regard the electron wave as analogous to the electromagnetic wave and if you regard the um, refractive index the uh, potential variation in the semiconductor as analogous to refractive index of the medium through which the electromagnetic wave is traveling then you, you can easily translate whatever we have discussed for the electromagnetic wave to the electron wave just as electromagnetic wave is scattered by a medium in which the refractive index is randomly varying an electron wave is scattered by a medium in which the potential is randomly varying in fact this randomness of the variation is at the heart of scattering so for example a phonon scatters an electron because phonon represents randomly varying atomic vibrations which in turn give rise to potential variation which changes randomly in space and time so this fact must be borne in mind that scattering is a wave phenomenon and once we understand scattering as a wave phenomenon later on we can simplify and treat this phenomenon as a classical phenomenon for deriving equations Thank you.